When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high-quality meat cooked at home because... Let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential. Three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Well, for me, it was really about realizing that money is not the root of all evil, right? Money, it's a bit of a cliche, but money is the root of everything, good and evil. And so my question that I'm trying to explore in From Monk to Money Manager is how do we make it work for the good? However you define the good, right? It's not up to me to tell you what your values are, but money is always going to be the tool that's going to help you live your values more fully. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Gaines. It will expand your brain. Hey, it's Shauna here with some really exciting news. You can now listen to our entire back catalog completely ad free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. Check out all your favorite episodes of Millennial Money, like How to Finally Master the Art of Budgeting. In addition to the Millennial Money Archive, you can also listen to every new episode ad-free, as well as tons of other ad-free Wondery shows with hundreds of hours of original content, audio documentaries, and exclusive bonus episodes from some of your favorite podcasts. You can sign up now for a free month of Stitcher Premium by going to stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery and using the promo code Wondery. Then once you're signed up, you just download the Stitcher app for iOS or Android and start listening. That's stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery in promo code Wondery. Oh boy, I am excited for this episode. This was a super fun one for me, so I hope you enjoy it as well. As Doug, our podcast guest, says, money is not the root of all evil, but we all need to be a little bit wealthy. That may seem like a total controversial statement coming from someone who spent 20 years as a monk, 
But as Doug talks about in this episode, there's a way to get in a healthy relationship with your money so you can live life on your terms. And to me, that's what it is all about. That's what learning about money is all about. It's not so you can live my life and I can live your life. It's so you can live your life to the fullest. In fact, Doug's money journey started way back when the monastery he worked for went bankrupt. That forced him to learn about money management. Now, that's a story you don't hear about every day. So, Doug, you worked as a monk for 20 years. You shared that with me. And interesting story you also shared is that the monastery where you were a monk went bankrupt, and that forced you to learn about money management. So I have got to hear this story. Yeah. So it's it's a wild adventure. Uh, <laughs> and it has a bit of a backstory, which is that I grew up in a rich family you know, where money was abundant but it was weaponized, right? So wow. it was really something that people used to manipulate and control each other. And so I ran away to a monastery where we believe that money is the root of all evil. And <laughs> n- n- obviously, you know, as your listeners I'm sure can realize, neither extreme worked out well. Um, my family shattered and the monastery went bankrupt. And that started my journey to learning everything I could about money management just to make sure that I never repeated either mistake. And then I noticed something really curious, which is that monastery guests who were in spiritual pain were actually really often in financial pain. And I'd pray for them, of course, but I'd also insist that we make a budget, right? Because you know, God's not going to work a miracle to fix a problem that you have the power to solve. Right. And over the years, I realized I had a talent. And so I, you know, that's another long story about how I actually became a money manager to take what I learned in the monastery and bring it out into the world. And so my new book, From Monk to Money Manager, tries to unite the highest ethical values and the best money management techniques together to help, you know, make you wealthy, the, the world wealthier, and to help love flourish. I love that. And I think you talked about a principle that I talk about on the podcast all the time, which is really the the mindset piece behind money and just kind of overall, I would say, happiness and what, however that relates to you as an individual person. We all have our own different definition of that. But, you know, what do you think is so powerful about that that mindset piece or how you think about money? How does that come into play with the actual – way we handle our money or we think about our money, or maybe we keep making certain mistakes over and over again. How does that mindset piece come into play? Well, for me, it was really about realizing that money is not the root of all evil, right? Money, it's a bit of a cliche, but money is the root of everything, good and evil. And so my question that I'm trying to explore in From Monk to Money Manager is how do we make it work for the good? However you define the good, right? It's not up to me to tell you what your values are, but money is always going to be the tool that's going to help you live your values more fully. And so a lot of people, I think, have this mindset that money is icky, money is only something that greedy and avaricious people concern themselves with on a deep level. Right. And so they think there's a they think there's a split between their spiritual life and their money life. And I, it's a really hard journey, but I think it's something we all need to make is to figure out how do we integrate our highest values, whatever they are for you, and how do you use, how can money be that tool which gives you the financial freedom and gives you the opportunity to relieve the suffering in your life that a lack of money will always induce, right? So so poverty is a real problem and the stress from that is unrelenting. And you have your own stories about your money struggles and I'm sure your listeners and I as well, uh, we all have our journey where we've made some terrible money mistakes. And then you see the, the pain that that causes. And so to try to get people out of that hating money mindset or being scared or terrified of money, maybe one thing I would I would point out is that you know, being afraid of money or even hating money is not the same as being spiritual, right? right. Because you know, hating the world is not a spiritual path. And 
the world runs on money, right? Money really does make the world go round. And so for me, the journey has been to take that reality that money makes the world go round and, and so this, this big and, which I think is the, um, the insight that all spiritual traditions are trying to teach at their heart. I think there's a universal message that we could take away from any faith tradition, or even people with no faith, I find, have a similar insight through their own practice, which is that we're all interconnected, right? There's no way that you can have a deep spiritual life and not see, and I, I use the word God, but that's my tradition. I don't want to push that on anyone. And, I, and for me, that word is very open. It's like you get to define what that word means for you, whatever your highest ideal might be. Maybe we just, for now, call that God, your highest the best life that you could aspire to, right? And so um, if that divine, and again, I'm trying to be very careful in the words I use here, because I'm not trying to push any particular worldview on anybody at all, um, is simply to say, you know, that it, maybe even in the Zen tradition, you could think of it in that way, that um, that seeing the, the interconnectedness of all things and seeing God in everyone and everywhere, that's a, a key sort of, um, I would call it a mini enlightenment experience that I think many people have. Yeah. How are you going to reconcile that reality um, with the fact that money is everywhere and everything at the same time? So, uh, you know, it's really a journey and it's a difficult one to bring those together, but without reconciling them on some level, I think you're never really going to be able to use money to get to that place of fulfillment or contentment or real satisfaction that we're all striving for. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Like, what great insight. And so how did you, I mean, how did you go from monk to thinking, okay, now I'm going to go into the personal finance world? I mean, those two things just seem polar opposite to me. You know, what was sort of the, the pathway that you used to get there? Well, I was also in a teaching community. So all of the brothers were also working in, in schools. And, and I was a classroom teacher for 18 years. And one of my um, great joys of teaching in a small school is everyone gets to wear multiple hats. And I was primarily a math and science teacher. And then in the middle of the school year, our economics teacher left unexpectedly. And there was no one to cover that course. And this is just, you know, this is a couple of years after the bankruptcy, after I'd sort of pulled the monastery through its struggles, I realized, well, I, I knew something here and, and I had um, an interest in it and it really captivated my curiosity. So I, I started teaching it for fun and I loved it. I was just really <laughs> in my element. It became my favorite course and it became a very popular course as well. And one of the class projects was to first look at our school endowment, which was great, and well-managed. And then I opened up our school retirement plan, and I just ran into a nightmare. It was absolutely a, it was a train wreck uh, on every level. And you know, as you know, as a financial planner, fiduciary duty is a big deal, and there was no no fiduciary sort of looking over the plan. No one really got any investments, helping employees make wise decisions. And one of my colleagues came to me looking for retirement help. And she was about 65, had never really looked at her retirement plan, had been teaching for about 30 years, and then said, you know, Doug, could you help me plan for my retirement? And I said, of course. So we sat down and it took us a while to get into her account. And after 30 years of teaching, she only had saved about $16,000. Oh my gosh. And she had a great deal of credit card debt. And so obviously this is sort of a financial nightmare that no one wants to face. And, you know, to see the suffering that this yeah. teacher was, was about to endure to go into retirement with, without a plan, without anything saved. And I, and I got really upset. And of course there's personal responsibility here, but at the same time, there should be a fiduciary looking over the plan and, and making sure it's well run. And, it, and her plan wasn't. It was being run for the benefit of the company running the investments, not for the benefit of the employees. So uh, investment companies were making a lot of money, but the teachers were not. And so 
I then tried to farm the plan out and bid it out to some other providers to see if we could get a better deal. And no one really was, I, I couldn't get a really solid bid. No one was doing a very good job uh, to the extent that I felt would be in the teacher's best interest. So I started my own company and, and decided to build my own. And it happened to just be at the same time that the New York Times was doing a seven piece expose on the very problem that I was discovering. And it turns out that the problem at my school is endemic across almost every academic institution in America. There are now 12 class, excuse me, 12 class action lawsuits against Ivy League schools for the same problems that I was seeing in my small school here in Santa Fe. And it became an obvious business opportunity. And that, and it, and it just really, and then of course I got a, the New York Times did a really lovely story on me and that really went viral and it really kickstarted my career. Wow. Yeah. That's nice when the New York Times says a story on you. <laughs> yeah. And it was not bad PR. Exactly. Yeah. So, so like, what did you discover? Like, what is the problem with, with teachers and the retirement plans is just, they have no guidance. They have nowhere to turn. Or is it that teachers think they're going to be taken care of in retirement and then wake up and realize, wow, I, you know, I wasn't an active participant and I didn't even know, know what to do. Yeah, it's really geeky and gets really technical really fast. But the the sort of the big picture is that in any retirement plan, somebody is should be what, what's called a fiduciary, right? Which which you're familiar with, which is the idea that somebody is responsible for making sure the plan is run in the best interest of the employees. And that typically the and the problem is that that responsibility has been forgotten in schools. So whether it's the head of school in a private institution, a board, um, a school board for that matter, for the public school, they've they've just sort of aren't even aware, I think, that they have this fiduciary duty. And so there's nobody supervising it. There's no one looking over anybody's shoulder. And that of course just creates a feeding frenzy. It's like, you know, these teacher retirement plans are like chum being thrown out <laughs> to sharks and it just and they just get eaten alive because um, most teachers and, and you know most people, as I'm sure you're aware, including myself, before I started being involved in finance, most of us are financially illiterate, right? Because schools yes. don't teach it, parents don't teach it, and so and these four hundred three B plans, in particular, that schools use, which are like a four hundred one k, right? But but for nonprofits, they're horrifically complicated. They're just the the rules, the regulations, just pile up. And then no one really is there to cut through all that mess and see what's really important. And so the plans just drift for decades. So they'll go for 30 or 40 years with no one making sure that the funds are good, that there's you know good default options, that um, the fees are reasonable, that the performance is solid, all those things. Um, and of course, we now know a lot about behavioral economics, which is you, know, you talk about quite a bit in your show in, in various forms. And that was those concepts weren't really around when many of these teacher retirement plans were created back in the eighties, right? So they've been basically these are these are plans that are using rotary telephones in you know a smartphone age. That's really the problem. No one has updated them in forty years, and they're just they're just clunkers. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news: as you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news. Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic, and it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, 
cue the confetti, there will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful, ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Algorithms can do so much more than control social media feeds. In fact, they have the power to save lives and improve our health. At the Weizmann Institute, Professor Yonina Eldar has pioneered innovative algorithms that optimize MRI scans and make ultrasound devices more portable, affordable, and accessible. Professor Eldar's lab develops AI tools that can pave the way to new technologies that can see, hear, and communicate beyond existing limits. Learn more at CelebratingGreatMinds.org. We'll jump back into the episode with Doug after an Ask Shauna from Mike. And Mike says, Shauna, I'm going through a divorce and trying to decide if I should keep the house or just sell it. We do not have any kids, so we just need to split assets with the home and retirement being the major items. I'm considering refinancing the house and paying my ex more from retirement. I can't afford the mortgage, but I'm concerned that this will leave me cash poor and hurt my future retirement savings. I plan on taking some cash out of the home for safety net and expect to end up with about 150000 in retirement. I will turn 40 later this year, though, and I am concerned this will really put me behind in retirement. I really don't want to move into an apartment. I feel like the cost of rent is only slightly less than my mortgage, but without the space, garage, and yard, I enjoy. I am not sure I'm thinking clearly about this, though. Help. Wow, Mike, this definitely hits (laughs) a chord with me for sure. And this is a complex question that I think definitely requires working with a financial planner because... You need to go in depth and they need to look at your assets, your debts, really look at the entire situation that you're in to help you figure out what makes most sense or to even just give you some food for thought based off of your numbers. And as you know, as anybody knows who have been divorced, divorce is not a black and white situation for sure, meaning there isn't always a right decision or a right way to go. Sometimes things pencil out and it's like, hmm, all right, well, this didn't really give me any help. And now I just purely have to make a decision. But again, I can totally relate to you. I was in this position myself and I found it probably the most tricky question of all to answer because I had to consider a lot of different factors that I didn't even really know about. And I I took out some of my notes that I went through when I was going through a divorce. And for me, I had to think long term. And there were a couple questions that I asked myself that I actually wrote down answers so that it would help me maybe come to a decision. So I thought about what does my future income potential look like? So that was a big barrier over whether I decided to keep the house or not. Would keeping the house keep me from achieving other money goals and things I'd like to do, like travel, etc.? Was hanging on to the house something that was going to put those in jeopardy? That was something I thought about. Did I want to live in this city long term? Um, or was I thinking of living in the home and paying off the mortgage and then having a mortgage-free house? So I really had to grapple those two ideas. And I really never have thought about leaving Los Angeles up until that time. So that kind of brought a new (laughs) element in me, thinking about, well, 
what if I went to a new city and I, I just had a refresh? I was able to change things up, change my friends, change uh, just change everything. And I also thought, what would I be giving up by moving into an apartment? And that one took me a long time to really think about. Now, this is also a question, I think, for a divorce attorney if you're working with someone, but there's definitely something to be said for your overall wellness. Like you described, the house makes you feel a certain way. You like the yard, you like the garage. All of those things are really important things to think about because sometimes it's not just purely a mathematical decision. So at the end of the day, I looked at the math of keeping the house versus not keeping the house and then weighed in how I felt about the house. How much value was I giving to how that house made me feel? And I also thought about how would I feel living in this house after I was divorced, living in a house where I had lived with my ex-spouse Were there going to be too many memories in there? Was it going to be weird for me? Or was I able to to separate? So in the end, I decided not to keep the house. That was my choice. And I I would want to make sure that keeping the house, paying insurance, taxes, maintenance, et cetera, would still allow you to have enough money in your budget to save for retirement, even if you had to take a little bit of a delay in saving for retirement. I would want to make sure that you could also cover any money risks that might put your mortgage in jeopardy, like disability. What if you had a disabling incident happen? How would you be able to pay for that mortgage? And then silly things that we don't think about, like having enough car insurance and all of those things that potentially could put your house at risk because if something happened to you or if you got in an accident, maybe somebody could sue you and then your house would be at risk. I'm a financial planner, so (laughs) I think about all of these things. I know some of these things aren't fun to think about, but I think really uh, structuring your decision, you, you obviously have to think about the math, then you have to think about how you feel in that house, then you have to think about what might be potential risks of staying in that house. Can you effectively cover those risks? So as I said, <laughs> this is not an easy decision. There are so many variables, and I'm sure I've not even halfway helped you make this decision, but I really think working with a financial planner and your attorney should help you narrow in on the best way to go. And in either way, you're going to have to make some adjustments, but I know you got this. I, I know that you'll figure it out. Just really ask yourself some of these questions that I asked myself. And I find writing out answers to be really not only therapeutic, but really to help you look at things from a an objective viewpoint, if you will. That sounds silly. Like if I write things down, suddenly then I'm going to see something different. But for me, going through this exercise, I, I was really, for me, able to figure out that I loved my house. I loved my house. I loved my backyard. I loved my wood floors. I I just loved every inch of that house. But... For me, walking away from that house was going to set me up better for the future because I was not going to have that mortgage over me. I was going to have freedom to be able to move, to be able to go somewhere else. And I knew I would buy another house in the future, but this was allowing me to take care of some financial risks that I was now going to be exposed to, to beef up some things that I had to walk away from in the divorce or that I no longer had because I now was going to be single. And it also allowed me to be able to walk into a house in the future and have a really solid feeling when I walked in the house because it was just, it it wasn't loaded with memories. It was a new, fresh place. So for me, that was my decision. Doesn't mean that's the decision for you. Staying in the house might be the best decision for you, but I just want to make sure that you work with someone that you that you ask the questions of your divorce attorney and you figure out what at the end of the day is going to set you up best for your future and is going to help you really manage this transition the best way. Do you have strong feelings? I sure do. My name is Sarah Walker Betcher and I'm here with my best friend, Catella Do. Hey y'all. We're the hosts of Strong Feelings, a podcast about work, feminism, and friendship. Every week, we talk about the stuff that really matters, like unfucking your work life or taking better care of your brain and body than just swigging wine and smearing on another face mask. Wait, I can still do that sometimes though, right? Totally, but you have to invite me. Okay, deal. 
We will also be talking about all the ways we're confronting our own bullshit, like how we're unlearning body shame or breaking out of the comfort of white feminism. And you'll hear intimate conversations with authors, artists, activists, and entrepreneurs. We'll ask them why they do what they do and what happens when it gets hard. So check out Strong Feelings, your weekly dose of fun feminist real talk with the best friends you didn't know you were missing. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or check us out at strongfeelings.co because life's too short to bottle things up. It just blows my mind that uh, that could be the case and that, uh, you know, how many teachers probably retired and and I even know people myself who we've had 80, 70, 80 year olds who are just baffled at the fact that they don't have any money in their retirement plan and that they weren't given any guidance. And I just, I think it's such an injustice. You know, the teachers are there to teach us, to make us smarter. And yet, I mean, this is, this could be its own podcast episode for sure, but most of them are underpaid and, and not receiving the type of financial education that they need in order to really make the most of, of what they're getting. Because in a lot of cases, it's not a lot of money. No, it's not. It's it's bad. It's it is a, a huge social justice issue, and and there's a lot of good people out there, including you know beyond myself. There's some there's some great advisors who are also in the fight, and we're trying to kind of band together nationally across the country to bring different advisors who who care deeply about this issue to try to bring some systemic change. Yeah, that that would be so so much needed i mean it's just it just it really blows my mind i struggle to find the words because it's just it really feels like an injustice but yeah i, I you mentioned your book from monk to money manager a i just love that title <laughs> <laughs> and i i really love a, a part one's title i had to just bring this up part one's title you say is all we all need to be a little bit wealthy and i think that's so great because so many people really detest the word wealthy but i'd love to know you know why is being a little wealthy good why should we think differently maybe about that word wealthy well i think for me it comes down to the notion that you know we know from research right um, and there's a what was it? I think it was the Journal of Consumer Research did a great study, and they found that the quality of your financial life, right, has as much impact on overall mental health as your physical health, your job satisfaction, and your relationship stability combined. Right? Wow! So it's the number one driver. The I would say the lack of money. Right. Let's just be honest. The lack of money is a key driver for most of the suffering in the world. Right. And if we can face that problem squarely, honestly, with good minds and good hearts, we can mitigate some of the worst problems in the world, especially for you. Right. So if we can honor the power of wealth and we can see what good it can do in the world and stop seeing it just as something that greedy, selfish, avaricious people worry about, um, we really give ourselves a, a chance to not only enhance our spiritual practice, but alleviate so much suffering for, for ourselves, our loved ones, and the world around us. Yeah, I think that is so powerful and so impactful. And it was was being a monk and working in a monastery, did you take a lot of those ideas and practices? Do you bring those to your financial business? Uh, are those those things that you try to uh, maybe infuse in some of your clients, maybe without them really knowing? But but does that bring like a sense of spirituality to what you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're a values-based firm. So I work at Longview Asset Management in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I primarily focus on teacher retirement plans, but we also do individual, our primary practice is an individual wealth management firm, mostly for high net worth clients, right? So our, our typical balance is maybe a million or so, but we start around a quarter million in assets for, for individual planning for folks. Um, but one of the things is that we're also the leading provider of environmental and socially responsible investments in our corner of the world. And that's been something that has been really for me, just uh, one way of bringing my values into my practice and, 
and helping my clients live their values. And as I'm sure many of your listeners are, are very much concerned about things like climate change and social justice. And so what we've discovered is that socially and environmentally responsible investing is now outperforming conventional investing. So yeah. it's no longer a feel good issue. It's just a smart money practice um, because unsustainable companies are unsustainable, right? Their, their business model has a serious flaw in it. They're going to try to eventually kill their customers if they, if they, you know, are allowed free reign. So, so I think when clients can see that, that not only does building wealth make their lives better and re reduce their suffering, they can put their investments to good work, to doing good in the world and get higher expected returns than conventional investing. And you can pull all that together for folks. It, things just click and they get excited about it. And it, and it really helps make the, the saving and investing process uh, much more interesting and, and, and um, as well as fruitful. For sure, for sure. And kind of going back to what you said about about the lack of money being a key driver for suffering in the world, I'd love to just know your thoughts because you've done a lot of work in this regard. But what do you think is, I mean, this is a big lofty question, but what do you think is the root cause of this widening, incredible widening wealth gap that we that we have in the US? Do you think we can ever work to close this or is this kind of just how we set things up here in this country? That's a really hard question, and I don't have a good answer to it. I have, um, I can explore it with you a little bit, but the root causes behind it are so complicated sure. because, um, but I guess I would say this, you know, it's a little glib, but my way of reframing it is to think that, you know, wealth isn't the problem poverty is right yes. so instead of having a mindset that wealth is bad or building wealth is evil it's like no we this the economic inequality is a really crucial social justice issue because it creates deep societal instability right so if we look historically back at like the french revolution or the russian revolution what caused those things was a huge disparity between the rich and poor to the point where the bonds of social the bonds of social trust break down to the point of revolution right so we we need to avoid that cliff because it, we can hit it um, but i think you know as I, I know you've talked about in your podcast before but i think a lot of it goes back to the 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 blessing and the curse of technology is that it's a it's an it's like a it can hyper enhance talent, yeah. right? So if you are highly talented and you have a great product or service and you can put it out there, like your podcast, right? It can scale very quickly and it can and it can it can reach a huge audience and it can sort of um, and so you, you have the capacity to scale globally very quickly and reach a wide audience, which allows for this tremendous capacity to build wealth and to make money but if you're uh, if you're cut out of the digital age if you're if you lack the intellectual capital to offer a service or a product that people need you're sort of cut out and i think a lot of it comes down to education and intellectual capital if we can find ways to improve our educational systems if we can find ways to um, help people reach their full potential economically and pull people out of poverty that way, we can start to mitigate it. But on a systemic level, I, I don't have a simple fix because there isn't one. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. And you're right. I mean, the best we can do is kind of bounce it back and forth. And, uh, you know, but I, I, I think that you're right thinking about it in a different way that wealth is not the root of all evil, as you said in, in the intro. But poverty really is, you know, a tough spot. And I get a lot of listener questions from people who are who are struggling, who are 20s and 30s, paycheck to paycheck, if that, and really just trying to make things work. And, and sometimes the idea of thinking of of some lofty goal or even just being able to pay off their debt is 
it feels so far fetched for them. And, uh, I really, I really feel for them. And I, I thank them for continuing to listen and and hopefully inspire them to just keep going. But I, I, it really is uh, across the board. A lot of people are just, just struggling, plain out struggling. Yeah. And as someone who's been through bankruptcy, I, I know exactly what that feels like. And to be struggling under that avalanche of debt that too many of us find ourselves under is is such a, you know, in my terminology, I would say it's a cross to bear, right? It's This is a terrible suffering that is inflicted on people and um, especially student loans and, and, and you know, all those things that hold people back. I wish I could wave a magic wand and make it go away, but Thank God there's people like you out there trying to educate folks and give them the tools to pull themselves out of that, those holes. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if I can even just be a little <laughs> ripple in the, in the water, I, you know, I'm so thankful to be able to bring guests like you on the show and lots of other people to try to just help people have some sort of inspiration and also empowerment that they can make changes with their money and that they don't have to earn more money. They can make changes right now where they're at. And I think for me, having that mental switch that happened for me, even with my financial education, but me really physically making a mental shift, things really changed. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't like I suddenly had a pot of gold sitting at my doorstep, but just even the way I was thinking about things, the way I was approaching debt, the way I was uh, thinking about everything, even risks, financial risk, just dramatically changed. So I, th- I think you know, being able to just have these conversations is hopefully empowering to people who are listening, for sure. Yeah. And I guess I would go back to, to add another thought to your one of your, your previous questions was um, looking at the historical mindset that I think holds some people back from building wealth is I think one of the key points that from monk to money manager is trying to make is the idea that economics is not zero sum anymore, right? So no one has to lose for me to work, save and ethically invest my money, right? Yes. The, the, the poor are poor despite my wealth, not because of it. And building wealth now is more like going to the gym, right? Just because I work out in yoga or on a bike, that doesn't prevent you from doing the same. We can all encourage each other, share our goals, and and strive to build some wealth for ourselves because our, neither my physical fitness nor my wealth comes at the expense of anyone else. Um, and I think that, was for me, was a, 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 a this light bulb went on. Like, I'm not – you know, if you want to be a good person – you're not hurting anybody by taking care of your financial life. In fact, that's going to give you the tools and the power to really have a more impactful difference, uh, an impactful difference on the world around you. For sure. Yeah. And you've had such a diverse life spanning many different careers. But if you went back and could tell your 30 year old something self, some wisdom about money and life, what would you say? Well, that's a great question because I think you know, my book from Monk to Money Manager is really kind of a love letter to myself 25, 30 years ago. If I could have just given myself this wisdom back then, I'd be a lot wealthier than I am now, right now. And I would have saved myself a tremendous amount of pain along the way. And so to my younger self, I would, oh, gosh, there's so many things I would want to tell myself. But um, <laughs> I think for me, it was going back to what you said earlier about that mindset around building wealth. It's like, is it, it's almost like this uh, money monster that just sort of lurks over you. And to realize it's not, it's a pretty, it can be, you know, depending on your circumstances, a pretty nasty dragon to slay. But you, you, if with courage and some good resources like listening to your podcast and you know all the tools that you've provided those really can help you conquer that money monster and and build the life that you want for yourself. And when you have that freedom, once you've gone, when you've been poor and you've been in debt and you've, and you've, and you've seen all of that, and then you get out the other side and you realize like how many more um, wonderful things will become available to you in life when you have some money in your pocket to spend. And I don't mean like buying consumer goods. I mean, 
And I don't mean like fancy cars and all that stuff. I mean, like the power to have an idea, whatever, whether it's starting your own business, for example, or turning your high, your turning your side hustle into something more substantial, that's going to take some resources, you know, just to build a website and, you know, market yourself. That's going to take money. And if you don't, if you have those resources in your back pocket, you can leverage that to make more money. But when there's nothing in the tank, you're kind of dead in the water and you're really going to struggle and your dreams really are not going to take flight unless you can put some resources behind them. Such great advice. Wow. Well, Doug, this has been awesome. Tell the listeners where they can go to find your book, From Monk to Money Manager, and where they can connect with you. Sure. From Monk to Money Manager is available pretty much everywhere. You, obviously, Amazon's a great choice for, for digital listeners, um, but you can get it in bookstores around the country. And if you'd like to connect with me directly on my website, it's douglinum.com. That's D-O-U-G-L-Y-N-A-M.com. And you can also reach me at Longview Asset Management in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'll give you everyone my email if they'd like to reach out. It's simply Doug at douglinum.com. Hey, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. It's absolutely free and you'll make sure you never miss an episode of Millennial Money. You can also listen to all our episodes on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, and Pandora.